So, uh, this week we'll be, um, we're discussing the Dhammapada. Um, it is a short, concise set of verses um, collected as an anthology of statements from the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni. It is a smart, small part of the vast Pali canon, uh, and, but as such, it is, it's implied that uh, as being statements of Shakyamuni Buddha, his actual words, as much as that is always up for debate. Um, and, there are, um, uh, and they are described as being found either uh, identically or parenthetically across many different discourses within the Pali canon. Um, uh, the, the sutta on a whole. So each verse um, is found in this collection, but is said to be reiterated or at least elucidated in various suttas um, within the Pali Canon. Uh, however, the compilers of the Dhammapada, uh, probably around the third century BCE-ish, uh, categorized and organized them into numerous chapters, uh, each concerning different ethical themes. <clears throat> Thomas Cleary describes it as such, the Dhammapada is one of the oldest, most beloved classics of early Buddhism. It's an anthology of statements of the Buddhist teaching, which is what the title means. Uh, it is drawn from the ancient Pali Canon, one of the great bodies of primary Buddhist literature. The original text consists of 423 aphorisms grouped into 26 chapters, known for its simplicity and ease, um, uh, easy uh, readability, the Dhammapada is perhaps the best primer of basic Buddhism to be found anywhere. Although they are described as simple and easy, I would argue that that would be the starting point for understanding their importance. But as I will discuss, the relevance, rele relevance may be more than simple aphorisms. Um, as for the title itself, Dhamma um, may be familiar as the Pali term for the Buddhist doctrine or teaching in Sanskrit, Dharma. Um, pada, uh, root being pad, literally means foot, um, and in this context it implies path. Um, and as the diagram shows, the Pali Tipitaka or Triptaka in Sanskrit comprises of the three baskets. There on the left, the Vinaya, the monastic rules of conduct for monks and nuns, the Sutta Pitaka, um, comprised of the five Nikayas, or collections, um, of Shakyamuni's discourses. Um, and these would be sutras in Sanskrit. Um, and finally, the Abhidharma, um, the scholastic summaries and explanations of the doctrines found in the suttas, um, which further detail the teachings through treatises, commentaries, manuals, etc. Uh, the Dhammapada is the second book of around 15 of the uh, Kudaka Nikaya. Um, there are additional texts in this collection within some traditions, and particularly in Burmese. They added, the Burmese uh, tend to add three more books to this particular collection. Um, <clears throat> however, for, for our purposes, it's important to note that the Kudaka Nikaya is the last of the five collections and is translated as the minor collection. This group is particular in as much as I might term it as, as like the remainder group. Um, it's a collection of those texts that, uh, that were not otherwise put into the previous four. Um, in that way, it, it actually comprises of the very early and the very late texts. So there's almost two strata there. The, the Dhammapada being identified as part of the early section, along with those you'll see listed there, the Sutta Nipata, Itavutaka, the Terigata, Udana, and Jataka. The latter of which people may recognize as the Chitaka tales, the stories of the Shakyamuni's many births. This is an important distinction because the aphorisms themselves can be found in numerous sources, including precursor writings found in Jain and Hindu traditions. This implication illustrates that to what extent the, 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 that some of the verses themselves may not have been of Buddhist origin per se but still hold truth for the purposes of the Buddhist path. If we were to assume too much, we might consider that Shakyamuni may have learned of these verses either before or while on his path to awakening, during the, especially during his six years of study. After all, there were numerous teachings of spiritual wisdom, ethics, we might call them big T truths, etc. That Siddhartha Gautama, as a person, 
uh, would have been exposed to. Therefore, we may consider many of these simple statements have lived on as being just as influential outside of Buddhism as they are within the Pali Canon themselves. Thus, as we look at the text as a whole, we should be aware of the numerous ways in which these verses are presented, translated, utilized. There are many versions across Middle Asia, including in, uh, in languages in Sanskrit, Gandhari, um, Chinese, uh, etc. And, and each may have different order of the verses, different chapters, um, and may look very different from, from the Pali version. Um, this may influence how we look at the text as a whole, but in each, the verses themselves may carry more weight than the manner in which they are laid out. That is to say, historically speaking, it is important to know which version of the Dhammapada is being studied and how that may play a role in the overall impression the collection of verses is meant to convey. However, practically speaking, taking each verse or couplet or chapter still provides an accessible way to experience the individual truths that, uh, that is meant to be conveyed. Slide, please. So having contextualized some of this, some of the history, um, and looking at the actual text, Again, depending on the version, translation, etc., uh, we generally see 26 chapters. Um, and you see those names uh, here on this slide. Um, I personally found this to be rather intriguing in and of itself because it did further help to contextualize each group of verses. Um, if I wanted to deepen my perspective on what happiness is, for example, how to best find, cultivate, maintain it, I would go to that group of verses. Each group has its own theme and emphasis, and therefore lays out the verses that help to broaden and deepen a practitioner's learning and experience of that theme. Some of these groups seem straightforward, self-evident. Some others may seem rather arbitrary. However, this is where differing versions and translations may, uh, may help to round out one's understanding. If we were to compare two of the many English translations, it may help to provide some additional context. I happen to have two versions here um, because their choice of words shed light on the perspective of each translator. Um, for example, as it, as it says at the bottom, those are chapter headings for, um, from uh, Mercado's uh, Penguin Books version um, and slide. And these are from Cleary's Bantam Books uh, publication uh, referenced earlier from the quote. You have both of those references at the bottom of your handout. Some we, uh, some we see are very similar. Um, the fool, the wise, the path, etc. On the other hand, there are certain chapters that seemingly convey, um, uh, that seemingly don't convey a similar concept at all. Um, chapter 7 in particular, chapter 13, 10. Um, infinite freedom and the worthy don't seem to agree. I wondered about this, and so I found a third version that has it listed as the Arhat. <laughs> Many of the other chapter names are in more agreement with the blue Cleary version of the chapter names. However, what that simple addition of an alternative translation um, now the, the, the previous two do seem to have more relevance to each other um, than had previously been understood. Within the early Nikaya Buddhism, those who took the Arhat path were to be considered worthy, noble of mind, not a frank, um, and the path itself provided freedom from samsara, the realm of rebirth through the experience of nirvana. My point here is to say that we can have a better understanding of any given translation when it's compared with others. One by itself is sufficient, but again, to broaden the perspective, to deepen our understanding, looking at multiple versions may prove fruitful. <clears throat> this can be especially true when the text uh, is as succinct um, as these verses are. So with that said, for background, the names in black are from Juan Mar Mascaro, um, a um, Majorcan-born scholar who taught in Spain and England, focused primarily on translation of Sanskrit and Pali texts. The Times actually had an obituary for him when he died, and it, uh, and it reads, quote, 
He achieved the unique feat of translation from languages not his own, Sanskrit and Pali, into another language not at first his own, English. His aim, decried by um, some academic critics, but appreciated by thousands of readers all over the world, was to convey the essence of the original in pure poetic English. Mm. Thomas Cleary, the chapters in blue, uh, was an American who translated um, from Pali, Sanskrit, Arabic, Ch uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Old English of all things. Um, but his introduction, in his introduction, he, he makes the point to state that, uh, to the reader, that his translating is his, from his self-described Mahayanist perspective. Considering a translator's perspective can help us in understanding these nuances of the text. Each text will often have a description of the translator. That can help. <laughs> I pulled those things from the that those descriptions from the book. That's slightly. <clears throat> Exploring that further, let's look at some of the examples of the verses. In your handout, um, you have the first two verses of the first chapter um, from Mascaro's version. Um, chapter Contrary Ways, um, in Cleary's its couplets. Um, and again, Mascaro's poetic version in black and Cleary's Mahayanist version in blue. Here, the differences in translation can be more distinctly observed. Um, what we are today comes from our thoughts of yesterday, and our present thoughts build our lives, life of tomorrow. Everything has mind in the lead, and the mind has, it is in the forefront is made by mind. So even just from the two phrases uh, right at the beginning, you can see a poetic version and maybe a more kind of, uh, uh, I might say, more, more direct translation or, or um, specific word by word translation. But point being is that, they, that, that both convey a similar intent, but both elicit a different feeling. I want to point out these differences because that is what I feel is the most interesting and fruitful part of the Dharmapada, uh, Dhammapada as a whole. Though each of these two verses are, uh, uh, verses are couplets meant to be read together, they can be taken individually and still provide the reader a wealth of exploration and contemplation. Reading the different versions help us to broaden the perspective of, the sing of that single verse, the couplet or the chapter on a whole. But the point here is that each verse is a source of profound meaning beyond what the surface layer of the words mean. And having differing translations may help to dive deeper into that profundity. So when reading both versions, now we can go to each with a different perspective, understanding it in a different way, looking at it, appreciating it, digesting it in a different way. The next set of verses comes from chapter seven, uh, the Arhat chapter I mentioned before. Um, and for clarification, Mascato, uh, uh, Mascato's version continues the numbering um, from one chapter to the next. Cleary uh, restarts his numbering for each chapter. So that's why you see different numbers there. Um, and here again, we can see how these verses pertain to the Arhat and the Arhat path. Um, and these particular verses are also a good representation of the amount of imagery and comparison found throughout the Dhammapada. So throughout many of the chapters, many of the verses, there's always a, like swans that leave their lake, right? Um, but for example, here again, Moscato adds and rise into the air. You know, it, it, it does provide a lot more imagery um, and a lot more detail in that poetic version. But as we see in Cleary's, we might assume that there might not have been the, the phrase and rise into the air in the original Pali. Um, both state that they are translating from the original Pali text. So I should predicate that, uh, uh, preface that, um, in that they are supposedly using the same version. Um, <clears throat> They also demonstrate um, the point I made here is that in each verse can be taken individually as a source of contemplation. 
Um, they are simple, quote, in that they are short and concise, but they are far from simple in their meaning. In terms of translation, Moscato's poetic visioning is clear, versioning is clear. Um, it can make a more pleasurable, more visual description. However, I might argue that at times the reliance upon that poetic side may confound the underlying meaning of the verse. Leaving your home for the higher home? That is fairly different than abandoning one attachment for, um, after another. Obviously, both have pros and cons. Um, both translations have pros and cons, but they mutually accentuate each other. They can gain more meaning from one by reading and considering both. Even more so if we were to consider a third or a fourth. We cannot see one. Uh, we, we cannot see one as wrong or and the other right, but different ways of describing the same thing. This could lead to a huge discussion on the quality and importance of translation. Good translation, but suffice it to say that the more versions and representations of the verses, the more rounded out our own perspective of the original polyverse can be. Unless you want to study Pali and Sanskrit and. More power to you, please, by all means. Um, we, uh, otherwise, we have to rely on these types of primary source translations. But this brings me, um, um, brings me to my main point about the Dhammapada, and in fact, all Buddhist texts. Namely, we have to read them. <laughs> we have to explore, investigate, contemplate, copy, Digest, internalize them, use them. And not just one version um, of each text, but hopefully many. How many copies of the Lotus Sutra have we looked at, for example? Again, one is fine, it's sufficient enough. But why not develop as broad uh, and deep of an understanding as possible? We cannot allow the perceived simplicity of the Dhammapada verses to mean that an experienced practitioner would gain nothing from them. Or that Mahayanists can't gain anything from the Pali Canon text. Many schools do not actively include all texts. And some are very exclusive. But as, ten as followers of the Tendai doctrine, we are way more inclusive. So there is nothing that should stop us from learning from the vast array of texts out there. True that Ten Tendai is a Lotus Sutra school, but not exclusively the Lotus Sutra. It's not the definitive teaching. It may be primary, but not definitive. And I would argue that relying on one text means that our raft to the other shore would be rather narrow, <laughs> or at least not as robust. Slide, please. So what I propose is this analogy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you want a raft or a cruise boat? Cruise ship taking you to the other shore. The Dhammapada presents truths that have withstood the test of time. Some older than Buddhism itself. They, wouldn't, they would not have lasted if they weren't of value. Why, why wouldn't you want to learn from those, experience those? Why not have a broader perspective, a deeper understanding of how to cross to the other shore? I mean, gosh, that, that, that cruise boat, whew. Uh, <clears throat> my wife doesn't like cruise boats. I, I'm all for it. Um, well, one thing's for sure you wouldn't carry it with you. <laughs> is there a middle way? <laughs> sure, you know, there's yachts, you know, in various versions of yachts. Uh, you know, there's Can dinghies, I dinghies too. I mean, <laughs> but build your boat. Sail boat. Have a boat. Build it. <laughs> right? Each text, each translation, each exploration can build our raft to be larger, stronger, more able to steer through the tumultuous waters of samsara. There is a wealth to explore in this text. It's, 
obviously difficult to cover in this short amount of time that I have here, but I would really deeply encourage you, pick up any version, any version. They're, they're relatively short. Most of this is introduction, by the way, okay? Cleary goes into a lot of um, uh, explanation within verses, between verses, and gives context. Each translation is going to be different. But we have to explore these truths and then verify them for ourselves through our own experience. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, uh, before, and, and next slide, please. Before we jump into the, yeah, see, I love that. Um, <laughs> I thought you might like that one. Um, sensei, uh, Ichishima Sensei, uh, I would ask you uh, if there are any uh, extra comments or additions you would add to our conversation this evening. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I like uh, Dhammapada very much, especially number 160. It says, oneself is refuge of oneself. Who else indeed could refuge be? By good training of oneself, one gains a refuge hard to gain. <laughs> so uh, this is, uh, I think, I, I like very much about it uh, because the final thing is, you know, each individuals, they must rely on true individual self. And so this is a very short message, but uh, I like this message very much. That is my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.